Hey, what's up? Today I'm officially bringing back my true crime plan with me's. I'm still staying home and not really doing anything on account of there being a whole ass global pandemic. So I don't really have a whole lot to talk about and plan with me's right now. So I figured this was the perfect time. I don't know what I should call this series. My best friend Michelle said I should call it Murder She Planned, like playing off Murder She Wrote, but that just seems inflammatory and I don't really want to be dealing with the feds right now personally, so if you have any suggestions, please let me know. But today I'm covering one of my personal favorite cases, which is the disappearance of D.B. Cooper. I just find this whole case so spicy. It was truly the perfect crime. Now, skyjackings were kind of a huge thing in the 60s and 70s, and to this day, this case remains the only unsolved skyjacking in commercial aviation history and is one of the FBI's greatest unsolved mysteries. So on the afternoon of November 24th, 1971, a man identifying himself as Dan Cooper bought a one-way ticket from Portland, Oregon to Seattle, Washington on Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 305. He paid in cash. Cooper was described as a quiet, nondescript, standard-issued white male in his mid-40s wearing a business suit with a black tie and a white shirt and carrying a briefcase. So he boarded the flight, took his seat 18C near the back of the plane. He ordered a bourbon and soda before takeoff. The flight took off on schedule towards Seattle just before 3 p.m. Everything was cool. It was chill. Then shortly after takeoff, our dude Dan slipped the nearest flight attendant a note And she just assumed it was his number, so she took it, but kind of brushed it off and didn't really look at it because (laughs) fuck the patriarchy. But then he leaned over and was like, "Mm -hmm, Miss, mm -hmm, you'd better look at that note. I have a bomb. The note said something to the effect of, I have a bomb and I want you to sit next to me. So she complied and he opened the briefcase just long enough for her to get a glimpse of eight red cylinders stacked in two rows of four with wires and a battery, just the whole nine. His demands were $200,000 in $20 bills. That's $1.26 million in today's money. He also asked for four parachutes and a fuel truck at the ready for when the plane landed in Seattle. When the flight attendant rejoined Cooper after informing the pilot of the situation and the demands, he was wearing the iconic dark sunglasses that are in the composite sketch. She described him as calm, cool, and collected, and even rather kind and polite. She said that he was well-spoken and seemed very familiar with the local terrain. They flew in circles above Seattle for several hours while everything was sorted out on the ground, and when they landed in Seattle in exchange for the money and parachutes, Cooper had the flight attendants and all 35 passengers deboard the plane. After refueling, the plane then took off again with Cooper and four crew members aboard bound for Mexico City. He instructed the pilot to fly at the minimum airspeed possible with a max altitude of 10,000 feet. He also asked that the landing gear remain deployed, that the cabin remain unpressurized, and that the wing flaps be lowered by 15 degrees. So clearly this guy knew his shit, like he had a whole ass plan here. So with this new flight plan, a second fuel stop was needed, which they all agreed Reno, Nevada was the best option. Shortly after takeoff, Cooper had the crew go into the cockpit, and that was the last time they saw him. A little after 8 p.m., somewhere between Seattle and Reno, Cooper lowered the back staircase, jumped into the night, and was never seen again. His tie, tie clip, and cigarette butts were the only evidence left behind on the plane. There were unidentified latent fingerprints, but those have never been matched. 
and both flight attendants he interacted with the most gave separate but nearly identical descriptions of him, 5'10", 180, piercing brown eyes, a description that has never wavered over the years. Even though he used Dan Cooper as an alias, the name D.B. Cooper was the result of a publishing misprint and it just kind of stuck so effectively he became known as D.B. Cooper to the public. The FBI did one of the most extensive and intensive searches in its history and found nothing. In November 1978, instructions on how to lower the staircase on a Boeing 727 were found by a deer hunter near Castle Rock, Washington. And then in February 1980, an 8-year-old kid on vacation with his family at a beach near Vancouver, Washington, uncovered three bundles of the ransom cash totaling about $5,800. It was severely deteriorated but still rubber banded in bundles and the serial numbers matched the ransom money. But to this day none of the other money has turned up or been found anywhere else worldwide. Those are the only two pieces of evidence that have ever been found outside of the plane to date. Cooper had everything meticulously planned and executed up until the jump, which he seemingly just winged. The FBI initially thought he was an Air Force veteran or a highly skilled and experienced parachutist. However, they later revised that profile, though, deciding that no one with any kind of experience would parachute into the conditions that he did, aka pitch black thunderstorm with 200 mile an hour winds. Over the five years after the skyjacking, the FBI followed thousands of leads and tips and had over 800 viable suspects, eventually narrowing that pool down to a cool two dozen. So we'll go over a couple of the big ones here. First is Richard Floyd McCoy. McCoy was a Vietnam veteran serving two tours as a demolition specialist and then later a helicopter pilot. On April 7th, 1972, he hijacked a United Airlines flight with a nearly identical MO. Really, the only discernible difference is that he got cocky and <laughs> demanded 500000 instead of 200000 So on April 9th, he was arrested with the ransom cash and sentenced to 45 years. Two years later, he escaped prison and ultimately died in an FBI shootout. Even though the glaring similarities caused him to be a main suspect for a long time. He was ultimately ruled out because he didn't quite fit the physical or age description, and since he was an avid recreational parachutist, they deemed him to be much more experienced than D.B. Cooper would have been. And there was also strong evidence that he was in Vegas the day of the hijacking and then home in Utah the next day for Thanksgiving, which would have just been logistically impossible had he been D.B. Cooper. So Kenneth Christensen was also a strong contender for a while. In 2003, his brother Lyle saw a documentary on the D.B. Cooper case and became convinced that it was his brother Kenneth who died of cancer in 1994. Lyle claims that on his deathbed, Kenneth said, there's something you should know, but I can't tell you. Lyle never asked for an explanation, but after Kenneth's death, the family discovered a valuable stamp collection, a bunch of gold coins, and 200000 in his bank accounts. He was also said to have bought a house in cash shortly after the hijacking, despite not making much money. Christensen was an army paratrooper in 1944, and in 1954, he started working at Northwest Orient Airlines as a mechanic, eventually becoming a head flight attendant. He was also known to have kept news clippings 
about Northwest Orient starting when he started working there and he abruptly stopped collecting those news clippings after the hijacking, which was kind of bizarre. Like Cooper, he was a smoker with a penchant for bourbon and he was left-handed, like Cooper was thought to be. Though he was substantially smaller in stature, the flight attendants said that he best matched their memory of Cooper, but could not conclusively say whether it was him or not. Web sleuths eventually debunked that he bought his house in cash, finding proof of a mortgage. They also discovered that he sold large plots of land in the 90s, which accounted for the 200k in his bank accounts. Though he still remains one of the main suspects in the public's eye, the FBI ruled him out in 2011, stating that any evidence was circumstantial and not really incriminating, and that he was too skilled of a skydiver and did not match the physical description well enough, even though the flight attendants said that he did. So, seems a little fishy, but whatever, we'll go with it. The last one I'm going to talk about is Robert Rackstraw. He was an experienced pilot and was arrested in 1978 on possession of explosives and check hiding charges. This dude also faked his own death in a fake plane crash at one point. He got in trouble for forging a fake pilot's license. He was just really out there doing the most for no fucking reason. And though he did look like the composite sketch, kind of, he was significantly younger than Cooper was reported to be. He did admit to being Cooper at one point, but then claimed later that it was a stunt. And though he was officially ruled out by the FBI because no real evidence tied him to D.B. Cooper, he still remains one of the main suspects in the public's eye. There are tons of other suspects, and there have also been numerous deathbed confessions and copycat hijackings that ultimately proved to be unrelated. But then there's... <laughs> Of course, the very strong possibility that he just didn't survive the jump. Although, with how extensive the search was and how much time has passed, some kind of evidence should have turned up by now if that were the case. In 2016, the FBI officially closed the D.B. Cooper case with no resolution. So, yeah. That was the D.B. Cooper case, and that was four pages of notes, so thank you if you stuck it out to the bitter end. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. I do have some more cases lined up, but if there are any cases in particular that you want me to cover, please let me know. I'd be happy to make it happen. But yeah, thank you for hanging out today, and I hope I see you in the next one. Later days.